I'm going to tell a story of when I was about maybe eight or nine, I believe. How many of you guys have bikes? You like riding your bikes? We used to have bikes where we lived back on the farm, and we always had these old junker bikes that my grandparents would get at garage sales. And I remember my mom had a habit of backing over them <laughs> all the time. So you never had a bike more than maybe a year or two because you were going to get another one. And I remember one time in particular that we had to get to town. I think it was to take my sister to cheerleading practice. And we were in a big hurry, and I had one of those bikes with the big Harley handlebars. You seen those ones? They got the big old banana seat. And I remember my mom got in the car, and she backed up over that thing and those handlebars. Man, they really hold some spring tension when they're wedged between the ground and a gas tank on an Oldsmobile Delta 88. And I remember my sister and I having to get out of the car, and my mom was in the car, and she was pumping the gas as my sister was bouncing the back of the car, and I had my mangled bike by the back tire trying to pull it out as my mom's roar, 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 trying to get off of that bike. It took us a long time, but we finally managed to pull that thing out of there. I remember joking, my mom used to have a a book she would tag them off of which kind she had gotten or stamp the stamp the dashboard but um anyway eventually after after another year or so i got another bike so it seems like uh when when the weight of life is crushing your hopes and dreams you just gotta hold out for a little bit and and the lord will make it all better now some Ancient words, some words that are older but not quite so ancient, and some words that have been written within the last 10 years at least. Our Sabbath school lesson is oneness in Christ. Over 2,000 years ago, or maybe not quite 2,000 years ago because he was probably 30 when he prayed this, Jesus prayed, Father, let them be one as we are one. United in Christ. That's our Sabbath school lesson theme for this quarter. And that's kind of going to be a little bit Dan's take on the church today as well. So the ancient words were, let us be one. Then about a little over 100 years ago, Ellen White wrote, there is need of a strong and united influence to cooperate with the captain of our salvation in taking the spoil from the power of the enemy and making men and women free in Christ. Pray earnestly, unitedly, perseveringly for spiritual power. The fountain of grace and knowledge is ever flowing. It is inexhaustible. It is from this abundant fullness that we are supplied. And then probably 10 years ago or less, Melody Mason wrote, when we pray together, we aren't just doubling the power for God works in the busyness, business of multiplication, not addition. When we pray together, we can claim God's promise that if we are filled with his power, and standing upon his rock, one of us can chase a thousand, and two can put ten thousand to flight. That's found in Deuteronomy 32:30. Maybe a new passage too, as it was to me. Another passage in Leviticus tells us, "And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight." And while there's a lot of power in secret prayer, and we all know there is, there's even more power when two or more are praying together. And that is why Satan is so keen on keeping us from praying together. It was probably about a year ago that we did the prayer triads. Maybe a year and a half ago when I tried something called United Prayer. And because our theme for this quarter and this day is unity together as a church, we're going to try it again. And what I'm going to ask you to do now um, will be out of everybody's comfort zone because including mine, because it's out of the ordinary, and every time we do anything out of the ordinary, it is out of our comfort zone. But I actually would invite everybody to participate. If it is so out of your comfort zone that it would make you not want to come back to church again, please don't do it. But, but if it's just enough out of your comfort zone, 
that it's okay. I really would like you to do it. And that is, I would like as many of us as can, instead of the few people that come, to actually congregate right here in the middle of the church. And we're going to show each other, and we're going to show the devil that we're united here. So if you can, you can get out of your comfort zone and come and join me here. We're going to show each other, and we're going to show the devil that we are united as a church family in prayer. And we're going to um, do something called an axe. It starts with A, which is adoration, then confession, then thanksgiving, you know it, and then supplication. So often in prayer, we just focus on the S, and we don't do the act. I've done this with my kids before. And um, even though our voices will not necessarily hear on YouTube, we're not really doing this for YouTube. We're doing this for us as a church, okay? So we're not going to take time to pass the microphone around. And I'm also going to ask you, because even though it wouldn't be a bad thing for our church to spend the whole church service praying, we really only want to take two or three minutes. So, so if you choose to pray during these different times, can you just just make it be a, you know, like a sentence or two, you know, and, and not a whole prayer. So the first part is going to be the adoration. And we're going to start, Lord, you are. And then we are going to just say over and over, you don't have to wait in, t in turn, just keep saying, Lord, you are powerful. Lord, you are mighty. Lord, you are. And that will be our first part. I guarantee God will hear it all. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you are love. Just keep going. God has many attributes. Lord, you are amazing. Lord, you are the giver. Lord, you are the healer. Lord, you are awesome. Lord, we begin our prayer today with praise to you. So often we just talk about what's good for us and not what really is all about you. But Lord, I heard so many people in their hearts and out loud saying, Lord, you are, and Lord, you are, you are all powerful. You are our God. And we stand here united as a church family saying, God, you're God. We're not going to focus on the problems. We're going to focus on the problem solver. Lord, when it comes to confession, we all have things to confess individually. Those are private, and we're going to take just the next about 15 or 20 seconds to just go up in our hearts to you silently and confess to you the things we need to confess, the things that are maybe keeping us from a better relationship with you. So we will do that right now. Lord, you have heard these prayers of confession. They were silent, but you heard them because, God, you know everything. You know our thoughts. And, Lord, I would pray a confession for our church. Too often we have got involved in other things and gotten distracted. And so I would just ask you to forgive us for that and to cleanse us and to create in us a new heart and create a right spirit. And now, Lord, we turn to the T, thankfulness, where we have things that we are absolutely thankful for. And I'll tell you one thing I am just overwhelmingly thankful for. When I walked by down to my Sabbath school class, I saw Johnny <laughs> teaching his Sabbath school class, and I thank you for that, Lord. And so right now, unitedly, we're going to just all at the same time, not just once, but over and over, either in our hearts or if you feel comfortable with it out loud, we're going to thank you for things right now.
And Lord, I hear the voices murmuring on again. We are thankful to you for so many things. We're thankful as a church for two pastors that love you unconditionally. We're thankful for pastors that pray. We're thankful for pastors that give us wonderful messages that encourage us. And now finally, Lord, we come to the S, the supplication. Lord, you know that you have told us to ask, and so we are asking. Lord, we're asking for the desires of our hearts. Some of them are so private, we'll just say them silently. Others will pray out. And Lord, again, we will come together united, and we will be asking you for the things that are near and dear to our hearts. Lord, you know that the, the prayer requests that are in the bulletin are just a minor, minor fraction of the people who need your help. So right now, we lift our supplications up to you. Lord, I pray that we as a church family and individually will not let anything come between that relationship between us and you. Because as Pastor Rick has said so often, when the vertical relationship is right, the horizontal relationship will come. And Lord, I pray too for Dan that you will be with his mouth and will teach him what to say. Thank you, Father, for this beginning that we can be united as a church family in prayer, in love for each other, and most of all, in love for you. Amen. So Kathy started us off about right. Uh, today is about stretching ourselves as a church. And um, me speaking is probably the beginning of that. I automatically reached up because I felt something behind my ear. And I thought, oh, I left my pencil behind my ear. No, that was the microphone. Sorry, not used to it being there. Um, so, you know, I started thinking this morning and I thought, the last time I um, spoke to the church from up here was the first week after Jim was gone. And then it made me start thinking, oh no, I spoke the first week after Mike was gone. And so I'm just here to first of all start off by saying I heard from Pastor Rick this morning. He is healthy. He is well. He is coming back from vacation. No worries, everything is all good. This isn't one of those talks. Um, but um, th this is kind of a talk about kind of stretching ourselves and kind of moving forward. And really talking about what Rick talked about a couple of weeks ago with us kind of forming kind of a visioning team. W when I knew this was coming up, I found what I thought was kind of an enlightening video clip and a topic line. And, and, of course, like every good pew sitter would do, um, I took it to Pastor Evan and said, Evan, I've got this great idea for you. And, and then him and Rick kind of backfired and said, Dan, we think you should talk about that. And I'm like... Really? That wasn't the plan. Um, so, so here we are, and I guess kind of looking at this topic, it's kind of a good thing in a way, because this is really a visioning group, and what we do as a church is impossible for a couple of pastors. It's only possible 
with us. And if we stretch ourselves like I'm going to do today, then you can do the same thing. And together, we can just kind of accomplish some amazing things. Um, so, when Pastor Rick talked about doing a visioning group and kind of putting together and saying, what does this church hold and which directions and what do we need to look at? Do we really even need to do this? Um, I mean, after all, shouldn't church just happen? Um, what are we to decide? Isn't this just God's plan? Um, and so who are we to begin making plans? And are we going to oppose God by trying to make our own plans if God has a plan? So some of the leaderships really crew kind of came together and we kind of talked about, you know, really God's plan comes for us, comes down to really just, you know, two things. One is really reaching out to others. Oh, my. Okay, so this is my, you know, rookie try with this. So you can't read that near as well as I'd hoped you could. Um, so it said God's plan source comes down too far. Reaching out to others and growing in our relationship and maturity with him. Okay? And so that's really what we're looking at. And part of that's come along with really our whole mission statement. You know, our mission statement, which was on the first slide when you really came in, really came down to those two factors. It was following where God leads and leading others to follow God. You know, we came up with this as a mission statement as a, as a team, a group, about 25 years ago. Okay, we weren't even, we weren't not only, in, not in the worship center, we weren't in Couch Hall. We were in a building on the lake that no longer exists. Okay? So we formed this mission statement about 25 years ago. And so part of what we're looking at is, does this even still work? You know, does, does this mission statement still define? And I think it, we really kind of came down, and, and I think it does. And, and it really comes down to the two factors. One, and if we look at John chapter 8, Verse 12. Um, and see, I went really wrong here. This is what happens when you put a rookie up here because when I read the Bible, okay, and all of a sudden, I don't know if you guys do this, but when I read the Bible and you're reading something, then you get to the red words, to me in my mind it changes, okay? When I get to the red words, I kind of hear, see Jesus like saying it, Okay? So I put these in red words, and lo and behold, you can't really see red up here. But to me, it is still very impactful, so we're going to stick with the red words. And, and as you can see, I don't have the fancy um, iPad to go with it, so I'm just using off my phone, which my wife said, will probably say it provides me with security to always have my phone in my hand, so that may be helping me with any apprehensions or anything I may be dealing with. Maybe a different issue. Um, so John chapter 8. Oh, Dave. I did put it on do not disturb, though, so don't try texting me or anything during the middle of this, okay? Okay, John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That is what it means when we talk about following where God leads. We walk in his light, his light of life. I mean, is there anything better than that? No, thank you. Okay. Um, then, I think the most clear example of what God gave us in his purpose was in his last words prior to ascending to heaven in Matthew chapter 28, and most all of us know this probably pretty close to heart. In Matthew 28, um, Verse 19 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and he said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end 
of the age. Again, this is what we're supposed to be about. So, so when you look at it and you say, you know, for making plans and setting goals, you know, it's really already established what we're supposed to be doing. So you're right, we really don't need to form a committee to see what God wants, okay? What we need to do is form a committee and begin to figure out which way he's leading us to do what he has called. There are many methodologies we can implore, um, but if we do not develop and plan a laser light focus, we cannot be as effective. And I think God deserves us to give it, his all, to give it our all. You know, in our homes, <clears throat> we can accomplish more if we really set specific goals and plans. In our jobs, we can accomplish more if we set specific plans and goals. In sports, we can accomplish a lot more if we set specific plans and goals. Doesn't God deserve more than all of these? And so that's really, really what we have to look at. And, and if, if we don't put a target on the wall, how do we ever expect to hit a target? You know, if we don't, it's hard enough to hit a target. That's probably me doing archery. Um, it, it would be hard enough for me to hit the target. Now, if you put me in a square room and said, Dan, hit the target, and you don't even put a target on any of the walls, wow, that's not so easy. So that's what we really need to do. We need to establish a goal we need to, and how do we expect to reach it? And so the purpose of a visioning group is to really help make plans and set goals and to help establish this target. And then at least we not only know where to aim and kind of what to do, but we even begin to know what success looks like. Okay? If all of a sudden you say, hey, let's just, we want more kids under the age of 10 in our church. Okay? That's a good goal. So, six months from now, I look at you and say, do we have more kids from the age of 10 under, I mean, under the age of 10 in our church? And you're like, well, I don't know. How many did we have? What was our goal? What are we trying to reach? So really, specificity really does help to help to know if you have to adjust the goal, go different directions, anything else like that. So last week, see how I'm cheating because we have two such awesome pastors, so I'm stealing parts of their information, right? Okay, so last week, Evan, Pastor Evan spoke with us, and he told us about a, the trip him and Lilia took. Um, how many people were listening? Where did they go? Disneyland, okay. So, um, so, Evan talked about it being the happiest place on earth. Okay. Um, now, I know I've been really serious and rhetorical, so don't go down the serious mind path. I'm just kind of looking for a transition into what we're going to do next, okay? Um, where is your happiest place on earth? I remember Shelly and I, you know, for those of you that haven't known us super long, we have six kids, you know, four of them are adults, and then, and then two younger ones, right? Okay, and so we have done plenty of trips to the happiest place on earth. And I remember when... Our first four, the youngest was starting to get old, and all they really wanted to do was ride on rides that would make dad want to puke. Um, so dad would get to sit down and watch things while kids are running around because mom could ride all those rides. And I remember at the end of one of those trips saying, you know, I can really say I could die a happy man if I never come back to this park again for the rest of my life. And I would be okay with that. 
And, and then it's amazing how your perspective changes because then when I got two young girls, it's all of a sudden, woo, it's the happiest place on earth again. And so pretty soon they'll get to the age where they won't want to ride anything dad wants to ride. No more. It's a small world. Okay, so, um, you know, and, and we'll kind of go back to that phase. But I was really happy. I remember we've always kind of done a trip about every February for when we, to kind of celebrate our adoption anniversary. And I remember a few years back, we looked at the girls and said, girls, do you want to go on a cruise? Or do you want to go to Disneyland? And my girls said they wanted to go on a cruise, which is why they're so awesome. (laughs) They were just wanted to go on a cruise. And so when we went on this cruise, um, we just had a blast. And so I'm not sure what your um, happiest place on earth is, but we've enjoyed um, taking some cruises because you can just kind of relax. And, um, of course, our next trip this February is to where, though? It's not on a cruise. It's to Disneyland. So we're back. Um, but how many of you have ever been on a cruise ship? Okay. How many of you want to? How many say, no way I'm ever getting on that stupid boat? Okay, um, so we're going to segue right now into a video that Aaron is going to magically pull up here really shortly. Um, And this video kind of compares church life to taking a cruise. And then maybe kind of makes a little bit of a flip. So, Aaron, are we ready? So what are we? Are we a cruise ship or are we a battleship? How many of us sometimes have more concerns on whether or not we like the music that they're playing in the ballroom? If we like the captain and his crew... Was that service good today? Um, Are my 
needs being met because me is what it's really all about, right? Um, was my cruise pleasant? Was it comfortable? And am I going to show up next week? Um, And I love that when you're watching that video and you're thinking, oh, I can kind of see a church. I mean, I see the correlation. And then, but it's a whole different paradigm shift when you kind of look at it and says, is the ship or is the church on a clear and noble mission? You know, that's really what God is calling us to do. And and that's kind of what we're trying to you know, put together and rediscover exactly what is that mission and are we on a clear and mobile mission. This one here, does the captain submit to a higher authority? Okay? I mean, I, I'll tell you, I can tell a couple of stories on p- people if they're not here, right? Um, so, since Rick isn't here, I remember when we interviewed Pastor Rick and we were there, and I had some really direct questions that I really was looking for as we kind of looked at where is their church going and who's going to be that person. And Rick did not answer a single one of those questions in the way that I was kind of looking for. And I got done, and I said, and I don't remember who I was talking to afterwards, I said, you know, he didn't answer a single question I was looking for, but I know that this man is led by God, and he is following God, and we're going to go the direction. It's not that he had the right answer. He knew that God had the right answer, and, and, and I will tell you, we're just so in- incredibly blessed to have a couple of captains that are just submitting to a higher authority. Um, how are the crew members equipped to succeed? Are we doing the right jobs as a church with equipping each other with learning the task and aspects that we need to succeed? And that's part of what we're going to be looking at. And then once we've taught people how to succeed, are they really able to contribute in significant ways? And everybody here should really be able to contribute in significant ways. And then I I think this is sometimes really overlooked, and I could even just bypass this slide fairly quickly, and I think that's part of the problem, is that are they honored for their efforts? Um, You know, how many... Okay, this wasn't planned. Um, How many people do we have in in here who have taught in the youth Sabbath school? Either currently or historically. Okay, can you all stand up? Children's division. I know there's more than that. I saw you guys raise your hand. Stand up. If you here or anywhere else have taught in the children's division in Sabbath school, I'd like you to stand up. Okay? Because you guys, I, ha- I told you I had six kids. You guys are heroes. You don't know how amazing you are. You don't know how important you are. You don't know how blessed we have been to bring our kids to you for you guys to share the love of God with them and help make them better people. And I don't think we've ever spent enough time telling you thank you and how awesome you are. So thank you. You know, and, and I think that's just so much. I mean, I... I'm in here, and I know they kind of laughed at me this morning because I was a little paranoid on was everything going to work technically. But the technical crew, Aaron just sits back there and says, Dan, don't worry, I'll have the video for you. And I'm like, are you sure? You know, and <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just everybody that does so many things. And, and do we just, are we honoring them for their efforts? And so then it comes back to, again, you know, what are we really about? You know, how do we, how do we choose? Um, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Okay? 
I am a spectator fan. We have entered my favorite time of year as far as sports is concerned. There's nothing like football. Um, but Christianity is not a, a spectator sport. When we talk about a battleship, it's real. It, it's war. Okay? Christianity is not like being a fan of your local sports team. But too often I fear we act that way. You follow your favorite sports team. You wear the appropriate team jersey. You buy a ticket to get in. And then you cheer your team with all the spectators in the stadium. Isn't that pretty much the same thing as Joe Christian signs up at his local church, puts on his Sabbath clothing, puts some money in the plate, watches the worship leader, musicians, and pastors play the game. Then he cheers or he says amen. Um, this isn't what Christianity and being a Christian is. The main event in Christianity doesn't take place here on Sabbath morning. Um, the war takes place on a battlefield of the heart. It's taking place 24-7. Sometimes there are others present to watch and to encourage. Other times there's only a lone Christian and God battling against the dark forces of this world together. So make no mistake, Christianity is war, okay? Christians don't fight as the world does. You know, when we think of normal war, we, we return good for evil. We love our enemies. We pray to God, to a God whom we can't see. But we are at war. There's no spectators, only winners and losers. The stakes of your life don't allow the elusive treasures of life to blind you from the fact that war is about, is raging for the souls of men and for you and for me. Your enemy is formidable, but he pales in comparison to the ultimate warrior, Jesus Christ. So you want to prepare yourself and your children for the war that is around them. Prepare yourself for the enemies without and within. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in case you think I'm going off on a far-off tangent, it's real. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For though we live in the, in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On contrary... Our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds, okay? So as we think about this concept, um, you know, if we look at the Journey Church, we are at a point in a time where we have to look and say, all hands on deck, okay? If, I think most people are familiar with that term, all hands on deck. It, it really came from, Military, it's about a ship's crew. If all of a sudden a time of crisis comes, being that they're being attacked, being bad storm, it's, look, nobody's taking a nap time now. It's all hands on deck. Um, it's a term we've used for ourselves. You know, the house is a disaster. We just found out, well, I'll put it this way since we have a house on the market. We just found out someone's coming to look at the house. And all house, all hands on deck. We got to get this thing straightened up and looking good in a hurry, okay? Um, so all hands on deck is, is really just a, you know, it, it's time that we all get together and let's work together. And it's a let's go time. And so we, when we think about this all hands on deck, we are all called to the ministry of God. Okay, we look at it, and I've said some loving, positive things about our pastoral staff, and because it's true, and they are, and I'm so awesome, so awesome to work with them. But I'll turn it around and say, hmm, every single one of you are the pastor as well. 
You know, every single one of you is called to the ministry of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, um, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into that wonderful light. Okay, so every single one of us are part of these chosen people. We've all been called to this royal priesthood. Some of us may still need to go work and do our J-O-B and have our family life and then have our royal priesthood, but it doesn't mean that we're not part of this pastoral team as a unit. It doesn't matter if you're a man, a woman, a child, a valued senior. I'm learning better and better words for that the older and older I get. Um, God has called every one of us. It doesn't matter if you're five or 95. God has, God has called us. Um, so and I'm even using that 5 and 95 because this, this little one sits right here who's not well into 5 this little guy can accomplish some incredible things just because he's so darn cute um, and so it, it's, it's and I don't want to exclude anybody who's 96 either so it's not a question <clears throat> If God is calling you, the question is, are you going to answer? Okay? Because God's calling every one of us. I want to, as we kind of start this visioning committee, and I think a lot of people have been asking questions, and so as the band's kind of getting set up, I just want to, for those who weren't here 20 something years ago, I just want to retell one little quick sh- story and then talk about how that relates to kind of what we're looking at. You know, when we started um, Journey to Bethlehem, and, and we talk about revisioning, first of all, I'm just going to say real clearly, I think we need to look forward, not look back. So that, that's not, so this story isn't to say, boy, how can we restart all this? Um, <clears throat> but when we were started Journey to Bethlehem, it was announced from up here in October, which is right about now, um, I think it was the next week in October about what do you guys think about doing a Christmas program and doing it the first week in December? Because the first couple of years we did a first and second week in December. And everyone was like, oh, well, there's no way we can do that. <clears throat> so what we did was we took, and some of the leadership said, anybody that wants to do this and consider this, let's go to the back Sabbath school wing on the left at the end of the hall. <coughs> Um, at the end of the service, we can kind of talk about if this is realistic. Church got over, and that room was so full no one could stand in it, and people were coming out the halls, okay? That is how a mission and a vision occurs. So as we start to look at what we're going to do moving into the, into the future, um, that's the kind of tenacity and the intention that we need with an all-hands-on-deck approach to say we need to move forward. <clears throat> um, and a couple of weeks ago, I'm kind of an impulsive guy, um, and so um, we're going to, who has their cell phone with them today? I just kind of got an idea. And now you can see part of my conversation. Um, who has their cell phone with them today? I know you all do. <clears throat> um, two weeks ago when Rick asked everyone to say I'm in and put it on a sheet of paper, you guys, I saw him later that week. He was so 
excited over the number of people that wrote down and put in, I'm in. And to see his level of excitement, it gave him a level of energy that's going to allow him to help us push forward. <clears throat> and I kind of felt bad because I was here. And I've kind of been talking with him about this, so he knows I'm in, but I didn't put it down on the sheet. And I probably should have. And so how many people have Rick's cell phone number? <clears throat> okay. I don't think it's a secret, so we're going to share it right now. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, we are. And what I want you to do is, first of all, let me... What, what did I say he asked for? I'm in? Okay. So I'm going to send Rick a text message right now that says I'm in. Okay. And I want you guys... Okay, so his phone number, if you don't have it... Say, look, I'm in. Then even if you wrote it down last week, mess with them some more. Um, and let's just all send them a text message that says, I'm in. And not that I'm worried that he's not going to come back, but it doesn't hurt to guarantee things. Um, <laughs> so as we kind of, you guys all send that off. Yeah, there he is. Um, and these guys are going to sing an awesome song, and then I'll come up and we'll pray. Can correct mistakes. Um, and sometimes you remember them too rapidly. So, Caro, who came up here to sit with me awesomely to help give some support. Um, and I called Adra a little boy, sorry. Adra? Audra? You know, so... In a society where pronouns aren't important, I still think they are, so I'm going to call it by the right name. Okay. And I got a message from Pastor Rick. <laughs> he said, so much for my vacation. No, that's a... <laughs> no, he just said, I guess your message must be getting over. I'm getting a flood of messages saying I'm in. Awesome explanation point explanation. So you guys got them excited. So if if you didn't have the phone and you don't have to send that, you can still um, call him when he gets back. Uh, for those of us, you know, you can email him. Or um, for those of you who still have forever stamps, you can go that route. <laughs> um, and and we will go from there as as we close. Um, you know, you might as well, if you're up here, do some of your favorite things. And one of my favorite songs, because I think it really speaks to this whole message, is a, is a song that was sung by Matthew West, who's probably one of the best lyric writers in contemporary Christian music. And this song really is exactly what we're talking about. So while we're going to have prayer and dismiss... Um, Aaron's going to do that magic thing again, and another video is going to come up there. And if you want to stick and watch it, great. If you're, but this will be the close of our service. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for these group of people. We are so happy that you looked down on us and you shined a light on this church to be a, a light to this community. And we just ask each and every one of us to help find our spot and how you intended us to be working for you because we know you've called every one of us. Thank you, Lord, and be with each and every one of us and be with Pastor Rick as he travels home. And Cheryl, amen.